Good morning. We're glad to welcome you one more time to our format here online. Whether it's on Facebook Live or YouTube, we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. We're grateful to have you if you're new or you've been here every week that we've been online, or you're one of the old faithfuls that's been around since we've been meeting in the auditorium. We're glad that you're here this morning and grateful that you've chosen to spend time singing together, studying God's Word, and asking the Lord to speak to our hearts this morning. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here today. We want you to, to watch the whole program this morning. We'll be singing in a few moments and have the sermon following that, but we want you to stay till the very end so that we can give you some announcements at that point. So make sure you stay, stay around that long. Well, we are going to sing. We talked about uh, last week some, some attributes of God, and we're going to follow that up again today. As we're going to speak about a faithful God that we have, we're going to sing about that first. One of these is a really well-known standard of the hymns, Great is thy faithfulness. And we want you to lift up your voice there in your living room or your home, wherever you're watching this, and sing along with the, the music and the words that will be on the screen. And just lift up your heart, whether anyone can hear you or not, and allow the Lord to receive your praise and for your heart to be strengthened and encouraged by the truth of that song. And then the next song is one that you might not be as familiar with. You may have heard it, but we actually have not sung that here at New Testament before. I've heard it, it's been an encouragement to me. I, I sometimes get it stuck in my head and I have to keep singing it. So I thought I would introduce it to you and I've made a strong push with our music director to see if we couldn't include it when we come back and meet together in person. But sing along with it, it's a very easy melody to learn. The words are so encouraging and it's very much a declaration of who we are and the God that we serve. So we want you to enjoy that, but be blessed by it as well. Sing along as we have this music this morning. Endureth thy own depressed 
Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd It has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And He was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Isn't that a great new song? I hope that you appreciate it as much as I do. What a great reminder of who we are in our God, what He has done for us. In fact, that's what I'd like to speak to you about today, because in a sense, I'd like to introduce someone to you. Many of you know him, and some of you know him far better than I do because of the years you've walked with him. 
but it's, it, it is, as you already figured out, it's God. But there's an aspect that I'd like to introduce to you today about who he is. It is that we have an incredibly faithful God. And in a sense, I want to introduce you to him. And even if you've known of him for a while, I want you to know today how exactly faithful he is. In what ways, in what areas of our life does that show up? I just want you to be encouraged by that and challenged by that as I have been as well. I was reading about several years ago, a postal carrier who was, um, well, let's say he wasn't quite doing his job. In fact, they found him eventually that he had not been delivering his mail. Instead, he had been hoarding it. Over 40,000 pieces of personal and business mail he had not delivered. It weighed over two and a half thousand pounds. And you listen to that and you say, what do you do with a person like that? Well, the one thing we can be sure of, we would not use the term faithful to describe him. When the postal inspectors did begin to do their work, they found those 2,500 pounds spread out because how it was first discovered was someone saw his car packed with undelivered mail. Can I just say that's a wonderful sign to know that someone is probably not doing their job. Then they went to his his house and they found it all over and in fact for years upon years he had not been delivering the mail and uh, it, it took five postal agents five hours to unload it all and take it away well he was charged with a crime obviously but we could say there are several things we might use as words to describe him but faithful would not be one of those on the other hand today we want to look at God and everything that he does and everything that he is and all of the history that we know about him it says nothing but our God is faithful. And many of you right now, probably at least in your heart, said amen, because you know that personally, you've experienced it. But if you can't say that in your heart, you don't know that, allow me today to point you to God's word. We have many passages this morning that are going to teach and instruct us about the faithful God that we love and we serve. In fact, he loves us first. That's a demonstration of his faithfulness to us. I would share with you first Psalm 40:10, where the psalmist said, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. We've spoken often about for the redeemed of God to say so, to sing out or to share. Well, what is it that we sing about? What is it that we share? One of the primary things, as the psalmist reminds us, is his faithfulness. He says, I've declared it. I've declared thy faithfulness and salvation. Could I just encourage you, Christian friend, brother and sister, would you declare and share with others the faithfulness of God? In fact, that's what we're going to do this morning in our study. In the parable of the servants and the talented, uh, or the talents, we find an interesting thing. We find the one who was given five, he uh, took that and made five more. One that was given two and so on. And then one just buried it. He was not blessed, but the others who were faithful did indeed find God's favor and blessing. In fact, we read about it in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Well, we find in that passage that this is something that is spoken to a faithful servant. And if we're honest today, one of the primary goals, the aspirations that believers have today is to hear those words said about us. Well done, good and faithful servant. To hear that God would favor what we did, would be pleased with what we did, that we would be faithful. But as soon as we talk about this good and faithful servant, we realize that we have a problem. We realize that we know our own track record. We're confronted with a sobering reality that we are not faithful. We know better. We know better than most others, in fact. When you can say, well, I'm more faithful than this or this person or that person, but the reality is we know that doesn't measure up. We have failed over and over again against the loving God. We make promises that we cannot or will not keep. We're we try and we, we try to do good things. We come up short. We, uh, don't fulfill our obligations or our promises. We don't keep our commitments. We change our minds sometimes based on our own preferences. How can we be faithful? How could we ever hope to be faithful? There is good news. The Bible tells us that we can be faithful because we have a faithful God. 
Notice what Paul writes to, Second Tim- to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. We know of the faithfulness of God because of the record of Scripture, because of the history of the Old and the New Testament, that over and over again, God demonstrated faithfulness to his children, to his people. David made this declaration, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. But for many of us, we need more than just someone else's experiences, more than just a record of history. We need some personal experience. We need to know for today and for the, the situations and circumstances that we face today, do we have a faithful God? Sure, he's proven it for others, but what about me? What about my life? How can I hope to see a faithful God? I want to make you aware of three things today, three areas in which God is showing himself to be faithful. Notice that I use that in the present sense here because not just in the past, God continues today to be faithful in our lives. And the first thing is an important one. He shows himself faithful when we struggle. He is faithful in our struggles and oh, how we do struggle. Paul says of our lives, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. It's easy in this text to focus on the problems. Paul reiterates it. He states it in a number of ways, and we can sometimes listen to that and have a pity party. What about me? I have that situation as well. But that wasn't Paul's intent when he wrote that. It was certainly not the intent of the focus of Scripture. We're not called to just sit in the corner and weep about all the things that are going on and how deeply we're struggling. In fact, when we look at these verses, he talks about being troubled and perplexed and persecuted and downcast. Maybe you can identify with that type of struggle right now. Uh, By the way, those struggles aren't reserved for first century Corinth. They weren't reserved for just the apostles. Those cross the boundaries of geography and time to us in our lives as well. They're not bound by age or social status or even by our financial standings. They are universal struggles. We all experience them at one time or another in one degree or another. Yet the focus is on this phrase from this text, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Some of us have gone through struggles and on the other side we say, look at how I endured. Look at how I got through that. Look at what I did to stop that struggle. What the scripture is saying for believers is to focus on the faithfulness of God who carried us through, delivered us, provided in the midst of those struggles. First, God proves himself faithful in his presence during struggles. The Old Testament people needed to know this. And so in Deuteronomy 31, 6, the scripture says, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. You know, it sounds a bit repetitious, but if you're like me, I need that repetition. I need to hear it and constantly repeated. Tell me again that you're going to be there. Tell me again that you're by my side. By the way, that promise is carried all the way through into the New Testament as well. We must have someone near us, with us, to go through struggles. Some of us have had to go through struggles before on our own. We know that it's nothing that we would want to do again. It's much better to have someone there with us. What happens? That they introduce uncertainty and instability into our lives when we struggle. The presence of someone else, and especially the presence of God, brings assurance and stability. Think about those times that you've been alone during a struggle. Your mind just gets carried away about consequences and things that are possibilities, and yet God would be there to reassure us, to settle us, and give us a a sense of peace. The psalmist says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. If you notice in that verse, the little word very, in the Hebrew, we've seen it before in other places, great, mighty, exceedingly. He is a very present help in trouble. 
He is right there while we're struggling, proving himself over and over to be faithful just by being present. Think of the wonderful truth behind that. It's not a friend who has to come and go based on their schedule or their family. This is a God who has given us a promise to always be with us through all of our struggles. When we examine our struggles, they seem to all come from a, a common source. They come from our lack. If you think about it, financial struggles come because we have a lack of resources. Temptation because we have a lack of resolve in our life. Loneliness, a lack of companions. Frustration, a lack of calm. And yet God here sees these lacks, health, sleep, a lack of time, a lack of peace, a lack of clarity, a lack of answers for the world. Any of these things cause us to struggle, but when God sees them, he is faithful to us because God has no lack. How is it that God can always be what is needed in any of those circumstances? Because he has no lack of anything. He has all the resources. He proves himself faithful by his provision. He's promised to make those resources available to his children. We read about that over and over again in scripture. What do you need? Oh, God has it. Ever gone to the toolbox? And uh, we had an experience with this not too long ago. You're looking for a bid or you're looking for a, a, a tip for, uh, for the driver. And you look and you say, I've got this whole set. And yet the one I need is missing. I'm looking for a, 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 a wrench and I don't have the one I need. I've got all the others, but I don't have what I need. I'm missing it. You know that God never looks to his resources and finds that he's missing anything. He has exactly what we need. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 2 Corinthians 6, 10, As having nothing, yet possessing all things. God doesn't just have power. He is power. He is, the Bible says, omnipotent, lacking nothing. He is a friend that has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He is peace. You see, God doesn't just have resources. He is the source. And so when you're struggling, that's exactly what you need by your side. Someone who has promised to never leave and have everything you need to meet that struggle. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Are you lacking something today? Are you struggling because you realize you don't have what you need? Is there a struggle in your life you just don't have the answer for? Be very sure today this is an opportunity for God to display his faithfulness, his presence, his supply in your life. Your lack is an opportunity for God to show himself strong and have the resources for that. Trust him today. His presence, his provision in your life is a testimony to others. Then there's a second place that God shows himself faithful. It's when we suffer. We don't like this any more than the struggle, but we do suffer. Oh, what a testimony the psalmist had. David had pressure from without and pressure from within, friends who betrayed him, family members who turned on him, people who were seeking his life. He spends his time on the run, and yet his testimony is that God was faithful in his sufferings. What type of sufferings? Mental sufferings, emotional struggles, physical sufferings. And he says in Psalm 34, 17 and 18, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. This book, God's Word, is a testimony of people who have trusted in God and found Him to be faithful while they're enduring suffering. Old Testament, New Testament, we can point to virtually any place in this book and find someone who is suffering. Yes, and many times it was physically. And yet God would prove himself faithful to them. This is perhaps when we need him most, when he is recognized as being the most faithful. It may be because we're used to the people who are supposed to be helping us actually forsaking us. I mentioned a moment ago, that was David's own experience. People he loved and expected to be there were actually the source 
of his suffering. I mentioned last Sunday, Job. He had friends who came to his side. His wife sat there and they just compiled and made worse the suffering. When, we wound, when we're wounded in our body or in our spirit, when we're down because of it, God has the opportunity to step in and not only be there, but be able to do something about it. That's what the disciples did when Jesus was arrested and was tried. I mentioned a moment ago that we, like David, have people who forsake us, the disciples. When Jesus was on trial, when he was on the cross, the Bible says at best they watched from afar. Peter, we know, turned his back on Jesus, publicly denounced any association with him, and the rest of the disciples were right behind. Even after his death, they hid, worried that there would be someone to find them and make the association with Jesus. They wanted nothing to do with him. Jesus understood what it was like to have people forsake him and not be there when he was struggling and suffering the most. When Jesus hung on that cross in great physical agony, suffering like we have never experienced. He had no one there to stand by his side. His disciples were scattered away. And yet, friend, Jesus did that so that he could pay for our sins. Jesus went to the cross and willingly took on suffering and even death so that our sins could be paid for. But you know, the Bible tells us there's even one more aspect of his death, not only because he was primarily there as our sacrifice, as our substitute, but he was also there so that he could understand our sufferings when we go through them. Think of that. He willingly went through everything we have, go, have to go through so that he could understand it. See, I don't mind being a friend to someone. I don't mind, mind telling them, I'm praying for you. I'm there for you. Can I help you? Can I run an errand? But I don't want to endure what they're going through just so that I know what it's like. Jesus, God himself, did that for us. And again, he is faithful in his presence. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. And when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And when through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God tells us there, as he told the people of old, I will be with you when you're going through this suffering. And whether it was the waters that seemed to overflow them or the fire that was burning at their soul, the Father says, I'll be with you. His presence is meaningful in our suffering. And friend, today, if you are suffering, call out and say, God, I need you here with me. There was a man that I heard some time ago give his testimony of having to sit in the hospital as his son was going through great physical difficulty, even to the point that he was ready to die. And this man said that to all of the decisions that he was being asked to make seemed like a, 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 an avalanche of problems that were added day by day in this time in the hospital, that he was being asked to make decisions that were swamping him, as it were. He was being overwhelmed with the number of them and the magnitude of them, and he described it this way. These people were talking to me, but I wasn't really there. And then as he shared his testimony, he shared the blessings of the wonderful blessings of individuals who were there for him in those moments in the hospital to support him, to encourage him, to help him. Oh, we all know what it's like to have someone there to be with us in our sufferings. When we seem to be overwhelmed, someone to help and seemingly share the burden with us. That is what God is to us. In our dark moments of struggle, we need someone there to to, to help us and to support us and thank God for the people that he's provided. But there are some sufferings that we go through when people are not even able to be there with us or not able to be sufficient or their words don't mean as much as we'd like them to mean or they can't do anything about our problem. That's when we need God, the faithful one, to be with us, to have his presence in our sufferings, to comfort us, to refine us and oh, know that he is working in us. Be very sure of that. He's working to refine us in our sufferings, to produce growth and maturity. We saw it last week in James, that when we go through these trials and we're suffering, that God is working out patience in our life, endurance, growth, maturity. And then ultimately it's to conform us into the image of his son. He's faithful to provide healing in suffering. Psalm 103 
verses two and three, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. After the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus returned back to Nazareth into the synagogue and he was handed the book of the, of the Old Testament, of the, of the book of Isaiah to read. And he claimed it as his own description. He said, this is me that was prophesied of. Luke 4, 18 and 19, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He promised in that passage a physical healing for the sick, an emotional healing for those who are brokenhearted, and a spiritual healing for those who are captive still to sin. He is still faithful today to provide those things. If you're brokenhearted, God is there to heal. If you're physically struggling, God is the one to stand by our side and provide a divine healing. And oh, if you're still captive to sin, God is there to free us from that. The Lord Jesus Christ came for that very purpose. When we struggle, he is there. When we suffer, he is there. And also, he is faithful when we sin. Notice that I didn't say if we sin. Yes, when we sin, God is faithful. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the area in which believers are often most found unfaithful. Why is that? Well, we've been saved by him. We've been adopted into his family. We have his redemption, his sanctification, his justification. We have committed ourselves to worship him. We have pledged ourselves to follow him. We call ourselves disciples. And yet, when we are examined in everyday life, we fall short. We fail. We have great intentions and then we fall back into old habits. We've, we have been freed from the bondage of sin and yet we willingly return right back to that sin that God has freed us from. We don't look so good on this tally. But we still have a God who proves himself faithful over and over again. You know, uh, we think about the, you know, all the sports are shut down, all the athletics. What do we have to watch on TV anymore? But I think about baseball. You know, we all know this truth. Three strikes and you're out. And for those of us that have played baseball or softball, we often say, well, I wish there was one more. Oh, the things I could have done if there was four strikes in a, in a, a, at bat. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? And when you think of it, it's really pretty fair compared to other sports. I realize that there's a mulligan in golf, but that's only between friends. When you're really playing for something that matters, your shot is your shot. The consequences are the consequences. Same thing is true in other sports. You miss the free throw, you don't get a do-over. You drop the pass, the play is over. Everything comes to a stop. There are no second chances. But the great thing about our God, this faithful God, is that he is the God of second chances. God's dealings with us demonstrate this is, that he is a God of second chances. He remains faithful in, even when we are unreliable, even when we are unfaithful to him. There are many people today who say the Bible and its message doesn't make sense. In one sense, I would agree because it defies our reason and our logic that God would do so much to provide for our salvation when we don't deserve it. That God would go to the lengths that he did to secure us as his children when we did not deserve it. To redeem us, to justify us, to welcome us into his family, to give us a purpose and a calling, only to have us fail from day to day. He did all of that for us, and when we find our lives this way, we would all honestly say, this really isn't fair. It's not fair that he did so much and that he wouldn't reject me when I sin. But that's not who he is, and that's not what he does. What we can't reconcile is that he wouldn't reject us when we sin, but that's his promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When we come to him, and we come to him with a penitent and a contrite heart, the Bible says that God has forgiven us of our sins because of the work of Jesus Christ, 
done on the cross again and again. Oh, we know from Scripture that's not to be a license for us to say, well, then I'll just go on sinning. No, if you truly belong to God, you'll not want to grieve him. You'll not want to hurt him. You'll want to live for him. He is faithful when we sin. And can I close this morning by telling you this? He is faithful to save. Every Christian who's watching right now knows this to be true. He's faithful to save us. He's faithful to everyone who will call on him for salvation. He's done all the work already. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He took on human flesh. He experienced every kind of suffering that we have. And then willingly, for our sake, in our place, he went to the cross. He shed his blood and he died, carrying with him our sins so that we could go free. That doesn't sound right, does it? But it's what God, a God of faithfulness and a God of love, has done for us. And the Bible says that he is faithful to save all who will call on him. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's his promise. This faithful God that we've introduced to you today from Scripture and from experience, that faithful God says he will save you if you'll call on him. Would you allow him today that wonderful opportunity to show to you how faithful he is? If you'll call out to him and trust him today, he will save you. He will demonstrate to you personally how faithful he is. No one who has ever turned to him for salvation has ever been cast away, has ever been rejected. The Bible has made it clear he has always received all who have come to him for salvation. Every time someone comes to him for forgiveness, he is there wait, waiting and willing to forgive. It's a wonderful demonstration of his faithfulness to us. So I ask you again this morning, would you allow him to show himself faithful to you by trusting him for salvation today? Call on him and say, God, I am sinful. I don't have an answer for this, but Jesus loved me and died for me and paid for all of my sins, and I trust him. I trust that for my salvation. Oh, when you trust Christ, he changes everything. That forgiveness is yours, that assurance is yours. Would you trust him today? Pastor Matt, I don't know that I could do that. I still have questions. I'm not sure about all this. The Bible is new to me. I've had a hard time understanding it, and I'm not sure I could do this by myself. Would you call today? Call me today at the area code 727-755-6822. Give me an email, ntbclargo at gmail. Call right now, and we'll answer the phone and take the Bible and read to you Scripture, and you can read along in the Bible to see what God has done for you, all that He has done for you. And you could simply today trust Him for salvation and be saved. Give Him that opportunity. Give us that privilege. Christians, for us as well today, we have to ask the question, are you struggling? Are you suffering? Are you in need of something today? Are you struggling because you've sinned and you failed God and you feel like you're worthless? Remember what he said, I'm there waiting and willing to forgive you. We often fail to recognize God's faithfulness simply because we haven't looked for it. Maybe because we haven't even asked for it. God, though, is faithful to do that. We haven't looked for it. We haven't asked for God to, to show himself faithful, to, to demonstrate his presence in our life and how he can work us through these situations. If you're not looking for it, sometimes it's difficult to see. You're trusting your own resources. You're trusting someone else or you're just sitting in pity because you're going through something hard. Let God demonstrate his faithfulness to you today. Call out, God, I need you. I'm hurting in this area. You've tried to do it on your own too long, Christian. Let God pick up the pieces and make something of it. He is always faithful. Scripture tells us that he shows his faithfulness in a special way to those who fully trust him. God, I cannot do this on my own. I have tried for too long and I'm just sad. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I need you to do it. And oh, he is ready, just as he is to save, to care for your needs. Our faith gives God a very special way to display his faithfulness. Today, that's what it's about then, giving God the opportunity to, to display to us who he truly is. Trust him today to meet your need. Ask for him and then look and see how he's at work. And probably you've not seen it all along, but he's been there working behind the scenes. Would God show you that today? 
1 Thessalonians 5, 24, and I leave this with you today. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. Christian, let that be lived out in our lives today. And if you don't know that salvation, that assurance that we've talked about, the forgiveness of sins, call us today. Give us that opportunity. Let's close in prayer. Father, you are a faithful, faithful God. And we love you for that because we are not. And Lord, the many times we failed you, even those of us who call you our Father, your children, Lord, we fail you. We sin against you. We forget to share your faithfulness and your goodness with others. We're silent with our testimony. We struggle with problems on our own without turning to you. God, there are many ways that we fall short. But thank you in and through that you remain faithful. And God, today for that person who's watching and struggling about salvation, not sure of their soul, not sure about forgiveness, give them the courage and boldness to reach out today that they may call out for salvation and know that all is right with you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, who loved us and died for us. Amen. God bless you as you live it out this week. And we hope that God will bring blessings into your life as you trust him. Well, we're glad that you stayed for the whole program and the whole recording this morning because we do have a couple of special announcements today, 24th of May. We're going to have an activity this evening at the church property. We are asking our graduates, whether it's college or high school, to come to the property and they're going to set up tables and decorate them with uh, their school colors or whatever else they'd like to put on that, some of their accomplishments that they've had through high school and just uh, let you know a little bit more about them and their accomplishment, this great accomplishment of graduating. They're going to have a place that uh, you can uh, give them a greeting card, thank them uh, for their efforts and congratulate them. And uh, you'll simply drive around the church property, you'll see them uh, very well marked that you can go to each graduate station and uh, tell them congratulations. We'll also have some light refreshments that we'll share with you. And because tomorrow is Memorial Day, we have a special gift for every individual or every family that you'll be able to take home. In fact, this is not only Memorial Day, but the more I think about it, you'll be able to use this on a variety of days as uh, you take it home and enjoy it. But that's a surprise for those who come tonight at 6 p.m. And then this is the big announcement that we've been very much waiting to make. Uh, we are going to meet back again in person next Sunday. May the 31st will be our first Sunday back in our auditorium. But we need to tell you this is simply phase one. We'll be doing this for a couple of weeks until we make sure that it's tenable. We can continue on that way. One service at 1030 in the morning uh, here in the auditorium at New Testament Baptist Church. If you're not a member or part of our church family, you'll find directions there on our website. They're kind of all over now online, but we would love to invite you. There'll be some limited seating, obviously, in the auditorium. We'll keep people separate. We'll have some special things put in place to make sure that you feel very comfortable. In fact, we want you to feel as safe and protected when you walk in our doors as any other place that you visit in Pinellas County or uh, frankly, anywhere that you go, you're gonna feel as comfortable, as safe and protected as any of those other places. So join us next Sunday morning at 1030. We'll have only one service that day and uh, we just want you to be a part of it. Now, there'll be plenty of announcements between now and then and some more reminders about what we're going to be doing, but we just wanted to let you that, know that because you've been here this morning. Thank you very much, and we so much look forward to seeing you next Sunday. <laughs>